So welcome everybody. My name is Gemma Holyoke and I'm a Senior Project Advisor at Community Head Housing London. Um, thank you for joining us. Today's talk, Developing for Communities, is part of our Doing Housing Differently series, which have taken place over the last couple of days. Um, we've been looking at how the principles underpinning community head housing can be delivered at scale across London and the UK. So community led housing comes in all shapes and sizes, uh, including community lands trusts, co-housing projects um, and cooperatives, tenant management organisations. More than a tenure type or design typology, community led housing is about resident control and representation in the delivery and management of housing. So far this week, we've covered innovation in financing for projects, how, how housing associations can support communities and how local authorities can empower residents by working in partnership. This morning, we're looking at the private sector's, private sector's role in developing for communities. So as social value gains traction, purpose-driven developers are looking to build schemes that meaningfully benefit local residents and businesses. Developers are increasingly working with communities from involving groups at, at an early stage to inform the brief to handing over ownership when the homes are built. In this session, we will be exploring the approaches developers are currently taking to future proof the social, sustainable and economic benefits of their schemes. I'm just going to do a few housekeeping um, a few housekeeping things with uh, this new online format we're all hopefully now used to. Um, so firstly, this meeting is going to be recorded and shared online afterwards. So please keep that in mind. We really do want it to be a lively session and encourage you to take part in uh, the Q&A at the end. And you may see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. Please post all your questions in there as the presentations are going ahead. Um, and we also really want to know who's in the audience. It's uh, very funny to not see everybody in front of us here. So uh, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Um, it'd be really great to know who is attending. So I'm now gonna pass over to our chair for this morning, uh, Owen Jarvis. Owen is Chief Executive of the UK Co-Housing Network, a member-led organisation representing hundreds of communities and citizens in the UK seeking to address their housing needs. He has over 20 years experience in leading social enterprises, tackling housing and employment issues. Owen is an advocate for using design thinking for social change and has also published on social franchising, innovation and scaling social impact through collaborations. He is a Claw Social Leadership Fellow and has completed a Churchill Fellowship. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass over to Owen. Here we go, unmuted. Uh, thank you very much, Gemma, and uh, absolutely delighted to be here today for our webinar um, on developing for communities. And congratulations to the community-led Housing London team. It's been an excellent series so far. I've attended several sessions and learnt a great deal. Um, Gemma's provided a really good backdrop for today's session. Uh, our, our aim for this session, if you like, is to consider the potential for developers to build community control into the legacy of their schemes. And we're interested in exploring three things amongst various other ones, including how developers are working to empower communities, what the long-term benefits does a community-led approach bring to developments, and what makes a successful working relationship between developers and communities. And our um, panel today, who will be coming on to shortly, are uh, Francis Wright uh, from Town, uh, the developer who's going to be uh, exploring uh, collective custom build projects and working with groups throughout the development process. Sue Riddleston from Bioregional, is going to tell us about their project, sustaining Chobham, and handing it over to a community land trust on completion. Paul Clark from Stories uh, will be uh, telling us about the role of principal developer in taking on risk to unlock projects. And Elide Obo from First Base 
will be talking to us about engaging with communities early and building partnerships and also posing the question, can we build community led housing into larger schemes and master plans? Each of our panel will have uh, 10 minutes to explore their topic and then we'll be opening out to questions. So as Gemma said, um, please do uh, pop questions uh, into the Q&A function along the way. Uh, you don't have to wait to the end. So as questions arise, perhaps after each of the panelists, you know, do pop in a question. We'll do our best to uh, address all of them. Um, nothing's wasted. The, the audience will be able to see a lot of the questions and to consider, uh, consider them in their own time. Before starting, I just wanted to say a few words um, about the topic from the perspective of community-led housing in terms of, sort of how we've got here today. Um, I think being part of the community-led housing movement, much of our work uh, it is, has been focused on supporting local grassroots organisation to address their housing issues, whether as local community or an intentional community and groups often need to become amateur developers working evenings and weekends as volunteers going on a development journey from finding land to accessing finance and overseeing the build to moving in of course and then managing the, the project. Uh, this has led to a number of inspirational pioneering projects, uh, several of them I managed to actually get to visit before lockdown which seems a long time ago. Uh, one of the projects within our network, Lancaster Co-Housing, have in just over 10 years not only developed their own housing scheme, but are leading the development of a community land trust providing affordable housing nearby, as well as a senior co-housing scheme. For me, this shows that once a community has been involved in the development process, even though they might not be professionals, people can pick up skills and experience that can be taken forward to help the movement grow. However, at the same time, many of us uh, within the movement have come to realise that if we are to scale up and mainstream community-led housing, new partnerships can and should play a role. It does make a lot of sense to consider the benefits of partnering with professional development teams, particularly those who share a commitment to social value and community legacy. So um, there are signs that this is already happening. When, community, when London Community Land Trust were unable to buy a site outright, they pivoted and par partnered with the private developer on the site to establish the St Clement's Affordable Housing Project in Mile End. In Birmingham, Housing Association Housing 21 is securing sites in the city and opening up to their local communities to invite them to co-design co-housing schemes for older people. And in Zurich, where I know many of my colleagues are really interested in, in finding inspiration, it's shown that it's possible to do community-led housing at scale. 25% of all homes are managed by not-for-profits, the majority of which are owned by housing cooperatives. And one co-op that translates as more than housing has recently completed 13 buildings with 400 households and 1,200 residents. So with that in mind, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to open up to our panel and I'd first like to go to Francis Wright from town, who's also a resident in a co-housing scheme and a member of the UK Co-Housing Network Board, so it's got quite a unique perspective to lead us through your presentation over the next 10 minutes. I've been muted by you. I'm muted, brilliant, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to be talking about Marmalade Lane today where I both live and now work for the developer. And Marmalade Lane is a 42 home intergenerational co-housing scheme that came about as a result of innovative procurement. And I think it's the first example in the UK of a local authority enabled co-housing scheme and a co-housing scheme that's taken the enabling developer route with a turnkey development approach. And it's also, um, I think, probably the first where a co-housing group has formed as a result of the land opportunity, rather than forming first and then seeking the land. So it's a, it's a story that is unusual in the UK so far. 
it has an interesting history. Um, it, the financial crash led to mainstream developers walking away from a site owned by the city council that was designated purely for market sale. And it still is a purely um, market sale site. And this council wanted a good land receipt, but also wanted added value, more sustainable and better quality homes and a stronger community. And inspired by a visit to Vauban in Freiburg, the council settled on a group custom build approach for a co-housing scheme for the site. And as Owen uh, talked about community-led housing, I thought it was worth just pausing and saying briefly something about what co-housing communities are. They're intentional communities where residents intend to live in a much more neighbourly and collaborative way than perhaps is normal. And it involves have each resident having their own private home and outdoor space, perhaps smaller than they otherwise would have, but with an emphasis on shared outdoor and indoor space, the indoor space normally being called the common house. And residents are normally involved in the design and the design emphasis on, is on supporting social interaction. And they go on to collectively manage the community. And this, um, this is Orchard Park where um, Marmalade Lane is. You can just about see it um, in the sort of bot in the middle but bottom of your screen and we'll see larger shots later, but it's part of a larger thousand home development. And the project manager was recruited and rec then went on to recruit a group of interested potential residents to, who developed a client brief within the context of a framework set out by the council and in terms of numbers and tenure. And this really shows the difference between the master plan, which is largely built uh, houses around the edge with a car park, courtyard car park in the centre, and then the group's ideas, which really are trying to preserve an ancient um, boundary line that has actually developed into a small copse and you can so that's their early thinking around that. In terms of the procurement process for an enabling developer it was a two-stage process. The first round was purely based on quality and the second built in the price and in both rounds the co-housing group was involved and they were able to interact with the bidders around their thoughts on the client brief. And although essentially a land sale, the three party cont contract deferred the land price for a period and required meaningful engagement with the group at, and also that the design reflected the client brief. And so from a developer perspective, it helped that the land price was deferred and that there were potential purchasers involved from the outset to help reduce the risks involved. And the arrangement worked well in aligning the interests of all three parties. And then in terms of the design process from the tender appointment through to planning submission, that was five months. It was very intense and there were quite a number of work streams that some of them which continued after planning was achieved. So you have there the sales and marketing and the legal where those were all collaborative efforts and trust was really built through that engagement. And while it didn't entirely erase the suspicion some had of developers, the quality of dialogue was really good and the relationship was positive and um, the and what was going alongside that was the group was having an opportunity to work together um, and really they'd already done some work on the client base so that really helped through that process and and began to really form the, the community too and so here you see the evolution of the site first on the left is the tender drawing uh, from town and the, then you see the finished outcome and really those two images show the story of collaboration between the developer, architect, other members of the professional team, the co-housing group members and the planners and each would probably point to features that are a result of their input from their differing perspectives and each had to compromise through the process. And the chief thing the process enabled from a community perspective was it gave a much greater focus on the space between the homes and how to really make those work for everyone's benefit. To use that design really to promote that ambition around building a community and encouraging social interaction. 
And the result was a car-free lane where a place where back gardens face front gardens with low boundary walls with benches to sit on. That lane is a very much as a place where you could stop and chat with your neighbours and for children to play. And then this large shared garden with quite small private gardens around it. And here is just a picture, you, the aerial picture of the community and you can see the lane I was referring to and the courtyard garden. And this building, uh, that sort of slightly odd building with a chimney is the common house. So it's a shared additional house with guest bedrooms, meeting place, kitchen, um, and a laundry. And in a different corner of the site, there's a workshop. And then I think I'm going to just talk through some final images, but that I think one of the things I would reflect on is that the result of all of that engagement was a sense of ownership that really was spent, extended from beyond your own home, that started before moving in. And that sense of community was forming alongside the development process. So that when you moved in, you already knew your neighbors. And that's a really powerful thing. And that combined with um, that intention to be, be a community and the shared space really has enabled the community to form quickly and continue to involve and evolve and be shaped by everyone's interests. And I think that's been unexpected for me, just how much that shared space in that community context has meant people can pursue interests and, and develop new skills together. And these images really capture that. That is a, a very large mural being painted on a development site opposite us by some of the residents here in Marmalade Lane. Uh, for many that's their first involvement in mural painting on that scale and this is one of my neighbours who started cooking lunch for people on Tuesdays um, because she really just wanted loves cooking and wanted to learn to do so at a bigger scale and here is a project of mine that myself and probably four other people involved in where we're looking after hedgehogs during the winter that are too small to safely hibernate and here are rescue chickens that arrived during Covid um, and this is a big community project we love picking up litter. Um, Ultra Park has a lot of it and so that's uh, a monthly litter pick and here is us clearing up a, a sort of nice walking area nearby. And I can't end without mentioning Covid and this is really just to show how spaces are evolving during Covid. Designed for social interaction, our spaces are having to evolve. This is our internal shop. Um, it has no windows, it's a storage space but it's become shop during Covid and here is someone using what would normally be one of our meeting spaces to work from home but from the common house. So that's really to just give you a quick insight into Marmalade Lane. I think some of the things to learn from it really are around that procurement process and the, and the value of community engagement right from the outset and how that makes a difference at the end, how combining that with the design can really make a difference socially. And I think that's it. I should stop sharing and pass back to Owen. Thank you very much, Francis. I think there, there is the there's some really good issues there that we can dig into, I think, a little bit more in our discussion. And uh, I think it really sort of demonst demonstrates in real tangible, practical terms the, the benefit of community engaging engagement throughout the process. And hopefully, I think it would generate a few questions around uh, the procurement process amongst our audience. So I'd like to now move on to Sue Riddleston at Bioregional. And you're going to amongst many things, tell us uh, about uh, one of your current projects, Sustaining Chobham. Thanks very much, Owen, and lovely to hear more about Marmalade Lane, Francis. Um, I'm speaking from another lovely development <laughs> called Bedsed, which is um, you know, our first community-led pro housing project, in fact, back in 2002, because it's a project that we at by regional initiated, even though we had no idea what we were doing at the time, 20 years ago. Um, we needed a new office and uh, we put the project together. We asked the local council about a site and um, we found this big site and we thought, great, we can live there too. So I still live here. It's a wonderful community. 
the first sort of large scale eco village, zero carbon, all those wonderful things. Um, so we've got a 20 year track record of expertise in creating beautiful designed communities that are zero carbon and enable sustainable or what we call one planet living. And there is a climate and ecological emergency, so that's really important. But we're also very aware of uh, generation rent. And from our experiences here at Bedsed, where although we're so delighted that people did put up the money to build it, they're a housing association, the residents association and all the things we do here, like in lockdown, the community garden, building uh, seats out of pallets. And, you know, we just feel like we could just run things so much better ourselves, <laughs> but people who won't let us yet. It's a mix of social rent and uh, it's too complicated for them. But anyway, so we thought, great, we'll see if we can, we spent two years researching a model um, on how we could add on to our One Planet Living, um, delivering true affordability and better community ownership and governance. So um, we don't have big deep pockets ourselves. So we settled on a sort of discount market sale approach so that we could raise the finance, build, and then um, pay it back when the homes were built and sold. Whereas if you're a registered social landlord, you've got a big war chest of cash and you build up more and more homes in, a, in an asset base that you manage and rent out. So um, that's the approach we thought we could take. And um, our definition of truly affordable uh, is based on average local incomes and the old school figure of one third of um, household income. And so to make it affordable, in that bracket, um, we need to first buy the land sold for a fair price. So this could be an enlightened landowner, um, or it could be that the land's only designated for affordable homes, it's not out on the open market. And to make the sums work further, we usually have to include maybe 20 or 30% of full price homes, but they're still in the community. Much as here at Bedstead, we've got every type of um, tenure from private rented, part rent, part buy, social rent and homeowners. Uh, and the affordable house prices are then permanently protected through the planning governance and through a covenant on the land, which is owned and managed by the community in a community land trust. So that's our model that we thought, well, if we're gonna build some homes, how could we do it? Um, so then we got about how, how to do it in practice. And that's the story of, of what we have done in Chobham. So um, first of all, uh, the, the land. Um, we didn't go to Chobham first. Um, I just kept asking around, Does there, is anyone want, interested in doing a project like this? And um, someone I know, someone in his family had some land, an old plant nursery in Chobham, which is a, a village in Surrey near Woking, about two, three miles from Woking, which is sort of commuter town, but also it's a, it's a village with a proper community. So um, we thought, okay, well, we'll see if the community are interested. So we had some meetings in the pub with local councillors. I knew someone who lived in the area and they sort of made some introductions. Um, the person who organises the Facebook page, parish councillors, and asked them if they thought that this, there was a need for truly affordable zero carbon homes that the community would own. And they said, oh, what a great idea. Yes, we'd love that. And uh, some people had heard of our work and there was sort of an enthusiasm. So we, we held a couple of public meetings and um, lots of people stepped forward um, and we got some more support. So we also carried out a housing needs survey because the site itself is a rural exception site, which is planning jargon, but basically, um, the whole village is in the green belt and the site is on the edge of the village. It's in amongst a load of homes, but it's hadn't been designated to be built on yet, although it is sort of making its way forward in the council's plans. So it can only be used to build affordable housing for people in the parish or with a connection to the parish. So that's a way to make the land affordable, to make it stack up to be truly affordable. Um, so we organised and paid for a housing needs survey, which was run by the Surrey County Council team. And they showed that there was a need for at least 33 such homes in the local area. 
and um, also there were a lot of people on the custom build register so local authorities have to have a custom build um, register and uh, they're supposed to provide some sites for custom build houses where people take the lead to build their own homes. So with the community meetings, inviting everyone um, from these sort of different segments of interest, uh, we then set up Sustaining Chopham Community Interest Company, uh, feeling that there was enough local support and sufficient people who really needed it. I mean, homes in the area were so out of reach of locals, especially young people, um, something like 11 times average salary. And so people were being forced apart from their family. Uh, having, so there were real examples of real people who wanted to join in. Um, so some of the people that joined the kick were local people who just thought this is a good thing for our community because Chobham is extremely community minded. And others were, I want to live there. Um, and then other people turned up who objected to it as well. <laughs> They're like, we don't want you to build anything anywhere. And I think if anyone ever goes to build anything anywhere, um, you do get the people who live right next door will always object. And I've been one of those people. <laughs> um, so we had some quite exciting and lively meetings. Um, we needed some funding to pay for the professional team. So we uh, secured loans um, from social impact investors for bi-regional. And also for the site, um, we uh, borrowed £70,000 from the Charities Aid Foundation, which is a way that all community-led uh, housing groups can um, get some funds to pay architects and so on. And we um, employed um, top architects, Wall Thistleton, who were Sterling Prize, Architects Prize, shortlisted, wonderful green architects to work with us. And uh, as the kick, you know, we just got started with having uh, meetings where we were having design meetings, basically. And so we brought our One Planet Living approach, which is based on 10 principles. It's about this general idea of living happy, healthy lives within the natural limits of the planet and leaving space for nature. And we've got 10 principles from zero carbon down to health and happiness and the economy and uh, food in the middle there. I'll put some links in the chat in a moment. Um, and uh, so there was lots of post-it notes, lots of food, lots of chat, lots of meetings, several a series of meetings as the architects went away, worked up the designs, brought it back again. Um, and we ended up with a lovely design because it's actually a former tree nursery, there's a lot of trees. So they concentrated the design into the middle. It's very neighborly, but also has privacy. And most of the gardens, there's a small private garden and then the kids can go out to play in the large sort of wooded area. So it's incredibly well thought through and we had two drop-in meetings for the community to look at the, the wider community to look at the designs as well although I think the wider community came to our kick meetings as well um, where you know more post-it notes more views you know I walk my dog through there can we have a path there okay so I think the, the strength of working in a really collaborative co-creating way is we came up with a wonderful design uh, and as I say I'll put that in the chat for you to have a look in a moment um, so we've designed 30 zero carbon sustainable living enabled homes uh, with big space for nature and a big biodiversity enhancement plan. And 24 of them were discounted between 20 and 40%. And we found that the people who needed the biggest discount were the people living on their own, even though they were buying a smaller place. So it's kind of based on need. And, it, and we agreed between us, you know, as a, as a kick, what should be the rules of the kick in terms of who's going to live there. Uh, it's not a community land trust yet. The idea is that it converts to a community land trust once the homes are built or during that process as we get towards the end of that process. Um, and so what's happened is that we were put in for planning, which was a horrible long delay. And um, people did warn us that um, it's really difficult to get planning permission in Surrey Heath the first time. And we were indeed refused because the council said, we just like standard affordable housing, but that wasn't what the community wanted because some affordable housing had just been built next door to that site. And a lot of people had shown up from Woking who didn't like village life. And, you know, they weren't, the people who, live, who lived in Chobham, who live in Chobham, didn't qualify for social housing, generally speaking, but they couldn't afford to buy 
or rent either. So, you know, they were these sort of squeezed middle people that were from the village and wanted to live in the village. So uh, we're now at appeal and we're waiting to hear, although with COVID, uh, the whole appeals, everyone that was in planning has gone straight to appeal. So um, we are now waiting until May 2021 to get our answer. But we have been told that we are fully compliant with planning policy and so it should be granted. With the, one of some of the challenges are, and it was the same at BedSed, it takes a long time to build these things. And when people need a home, they need a home. And so some people who were super enthusiastic at the beginning are like, I've just got to move away now. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm really keen. I'll still be part of the kick, but I've got to, I'm going. I can't buy a place now. Um, and new people have turned up. And that's also what happens with BedSed. And we have a community here for nearly 20 years where people come and go. And when they come, they just join in wholeheartedly if that's what they want to do, or they keep it private if that's what they want to do. So today we have the finance and expertise uh, to deliver this project in Chobham uh, because we've uh, created a partnership, a formal partnership with the Hill Group who build social housing and have strong values. Um, so like our values are aligned and they've also got a very big bank account so they can fund and the construction team. So basically we've got a sort of dream team of bi-regional and all of our experience of working with the community, creating zero carbon homes and Hill who've got the money and the construction team. So we can sort of manage the whole process from securing the land, financing the project to handing over the keys. So fingers crossed for planning for Chobham. I know you'll all hope we get it too. Even the people who objected locally said, well, we just don't want anything built there, but if anything was going to be built, that's a lovely scheme. <laughs> so uh, there we go. Look forward to your questions. And yeah, if anyone wants to partner with us, do get in touch. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think, that, I mean, there's a lot in that. And again, we'll probably uh, be able to uh, unpack that a little bit in the questions. As I'm, I imagine there'll be lots of really interesting questions about your community engagement process, your partnership with Hill, and best of luck getting that through. Really hope that's uh, going to come kind of come good for you. So yes, lots of lots of questions and things to explore there. So thank you very, very much. Um, so next next up, we've got um, Paul Clark from Stories, and just like to yeah, he's going to Paul's going to be leading us a little bit on a discussion around the role of the principal developer in taking on risk to unlock projects. And um, Paul, it's probably fair to say you're a new new organisation, new company on the scene, really. So you're bringing sort of fresh approaches as well as a lot of experience from your your um, uh, backgrounds with with Argent and major developments. So um, yeah, really look forward to uh, invite you to, to come in and tell us a bit more about uh, your take on the topic. Hello. Hello. Is this working yet? Yes, very good. Very it's good. all going. It's all going. Hello, everyone. Um, Good to be with you. I'm a bit hoarse, I'm afraid. <clears throat> but um, thanks for um, inviting me along, and it's um, delighted to be in such a steam company. Um, as you said, you know, Stories is a new business. We're two, we're two years old um, this month, I think, and um, we've been created. Uh, there were three co founders, and we're now four staff. Uh, two of whom um, spent uh, some 15 years at Argent, uh, leading on King's Cross. Uh, that's Richard Meyer and, and Ollie Bennett. And then James Scott, who was the former um, chief operating officer at The Collective, which is a co-living um, pioneering business. And, and my own background is, uh, is, is varied through the planning and development industry. And um, I've worked um, in the public and the private sector over a number of years. But my last role was, was head of development at uh, Geo Hearn, where my personal role was, was trying to find development partners for landowners who had broader and long-term social objectives and um, <clears throat> part of the rationale for stories was really a uh, we'd each each kind of come to our own decision that, that um, there weren't enough developers in the market that really were bringing that level of empathy that was needed to really do do good things um, uh, through the development process 
Um, you know, we very much set up stories with the express uh, intention uh, of delivering development in the interests of people. And we talk a lot about, about shared value rather than shareholder value. And, and it really comes from a perspective that from our, you know, in our experience, it's, it's community that creates value. Um, developers certainly unlock it, but it, it's, it's created by community. And I always give the example of, of, of new homes brochures when they, when they come out. Um, the first 80% of a new homes brochure is images of community. It's shops and schools and parks, it's infrastructure. Um, this, you're selling community before you're selling property. And that, that's very much a, a, guiding, a guiding feature of what we try to achieve with stories. Um, so our first focus is always on people. And generally we start looking at the people that live outside the red line boundary of, of the projects we're looking at. And um, we do also try and focus on the lowest third indices of deprivation. One of the questions we constantly ask ourselves is, you know, is our presence in this project going to facilitate something good? Um, and good with you know a capital G public good um, if it's got planning permission or if it's just a kind of a, a shootout for the highest land value we'll, we'll tend to avoid it um, so we're focusing very much on, on landowners who kind of share that ambition to create you know long-term positive social impact in the communities that that land is, 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 um, is situated within and that that process has very much led us into the hands of community-led housing London and, and the wider community-led housing agenda which we very much subscribe to. Um, our first project is actually um, in planning with St Mungo's in Westminster so we're working with a homelessness charity um, to build them a new, um, a new homeless facility in Westminster and deliver that for, for, for nil cost to the, count, the charity. They keep their land, um, they keep um, they get a new building for nothing and uh, we're building a build to rent um, project next door targeting uh, we're trying to hit 50 percent affordable of, of the net gain as well um, and so we come at this um, we come at this agenda from two perspectives really it's like one is how, how do we create development projects that generate long-term positive impact in the local community and then and then actually how to facilitate a community-led housing um community housing on, on a place-based agenda rather than a kind of a, a self-selecting social agenda. So we're very much interested in, in, that, in, in the ben benefits that can, can accrue outside the red line. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really, you know, what we've been reflecting on recently is even if you gen generally approach us from the right place, um, you know, we, we've, we've, we've got aligned investors, we, we've got you know, we are a pending benefit corporation, so we're one of the few development companies that are committing to the triple bottom line that, um, that um, uh, the B Corp movement uh, promotes. So our, our own um, articles of association, articles of uh, um, association of the company talk about, you know, social, environmental, economic um, um, ambition. So we very much put those equal as, as directors of the business very much putting social impact alongside um, um, profitability um, but you know we come at this from the right agenda and we we are it's difficult it is really difficult to kind of square the circle in the sense that um, when you're dealing with landowners and, and this is something obviously that um, was being reflected on just now too often really it's a straight shootout on price and so you're always looking for those landowners who are aligned to your mission as it were um, and we are finding we are finding um, we are finding that in places it's pretty difficult and actually what we've been doing is, is really picking apart the development agreement uh, contracts that we use and I think we could go on to that so a lot of my work has been around creating joint ventures and development agreements between developers and landowners and so we come with a huge amount of expertise and experience in that and really what we've been doing is working out ways where we get everyone to lean in a little bit um, so no one is taking the, the full burden of kind of the extra cost of trying to deliver enhanced value outside the red line. And so um, one of the models that we're looking at, and we're engaged with the London boroughs where we, um, the community is involved in the process and we seek to transfer ownership and responsibility of this completed scheme over time. And so from, from day one, uh, there's a community group of some description who will be seeded by us and then um, they will receive uh, two percent of net revenue off of a built to rent scheme to help manage it in perpetuity in the interests of the community um, and one of the things that we're bumping up against really though is 
is this question of risk. So the, the extension of that is to try and is to try and carve out, you know, a number of homes, a bit like at Marmalade Lane. Um, but it's it's it, it can be challenging in the sense that you have um, you have a landowner, often a local authority involved as well, who are purely pursuing numbers, and they're trying to get people off their own housing waiting list. So they they see this sort of contribution to affordable housing as not really qualifying, and hence the challenges that uh, Bar Regional are having in Surrey Heath. It's very much a similar story that we're seeing, and um, and then you have the funders who are obviously um, putting up the money for this and and looking at looking kind of sideways at you suggesting that you might carve out a chunk for a community group you know an, un an undefined group of people with undefined resources and undefined expertise and they just see risk on risk where you know the process of development very much is the, the process of identifying pricing and taking risk so um we we're sort of really committed to the agenda and um you know looking hard at how we how we create those outcomes um, for the community groups uh, that we're trying to work with um so we're really we're sort of really on a journey that um um i mean I'm in, that's the reason i'm in, uh, delighted to be here to be here with you but i think it's it it can be can be quite difficult to convince all the stakeholders that you need to that that um sort of bringing a community group into a process which is uh you know f already fraught with risk and you're, you're inviting all the stakeholders to take on more risk is, is, is quite challenging and there is the point that you perhaps resolve the question of market risk um, by sort of being able to identify pre-lets or forward sales to, to a community group. But at the moment, we haven't quite got to a place where I think there's enough comfort that it can be done effectively and efficiently. And I think that's why things like Marmalade Lane are so important is showing people the way and, um, and, and showing how it can be achieved in, in a collaborative way through procurement. Um, and that's that's very much where we are as well. But I think what we're looking at, uh, as, and as, as I said before, very much looking at how you structure how you structure development agreements that do defer payments, that do um, you know carve out uh, where, where where you're where you're actually resolving market risk. You can reduce the cost of developer risk, so you can you can balance those those two things off. So one thing can offset the other. And I'll be happy to engage with people about how we've done that with St Mungo's, for example. It's very much um, uh, been achieved there with, 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 their, with their interest at heart as well. I'll leave it there for now, conscious there's a number of other people on the line. That's great, Paul. Thank you very much. I think you've raised a lot of issues and you've got a huge amount of expertise that I think we're all going to really want to uh, explore a bit more in detail. I think particularly around managing risk and, and a better understanding of I suppose what what developers, private sector developers with experience bring to the community and housing sector in terms of the expertise, knowledge, and I think Sue was referring to that a little bit with her partnership with with Hill earlier in terms of for, for the community sector to better understand what, what what opportunities there are, but I suppose also exploring a bit more this perception of risk within community led housing and how it's mitigated, I think is, is would be really, uh, really interesting to explore a bit further. So thank you very much. Really like to hear a lot more, a lot, lot, lot more from your insights and experience as you grow your company in this sector. Um, so I'm, I'd just like to invite um, Olaide um, Obo into talk from First Base. Um, and to, we're going to be exploring engaging with communities from an early stage and building partnerships and what that, what that might mean. Uh, and I'm also very interested, uh, earlier in the week, the Deputy Mayor was reminding us of the, the uh, GLA targets around 50,000 plus new homes a year, particularly with a focus on affordability. And um, I'm really interested in this second question that you're interested in around, can we build community-led homes into larger schemes and master plans? And uh, we'd love to hear a bit more from that. So um, yeah, if you if you could take your 10 minutes, we'd love, love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join um, the panel uh, and to speak this morning. I um, I'm completely overwhelmed by everything I've heard so far, you know, some really interesting examples and some great work going on. Um, I'm also fortunate to have spent um, a wonderful morning in Marmalade Lane. I um, literally had heard so much about Marmalade Lane, so I rocked up just randomly and I was peering through the windows of um, the common house and someone came out and offered me, offered to, 
offered me and invited me in. I was like, okay, thank you. And literally, I think it was about three hours later, I was still there and had cakes, I'd been giving cookies, I'd had numerous cups of tea, a complete tour. And for me, it just cemented, you know, exactly what um, a proper community is. And I remember saying to my husband recently, like, gosh, imagine how much lovely lockdown would be if we were in Marmalade Lane. It'd be so much, so much better. And I promised my daughter I'm going to bring her back because she just, she was so excited about the prospect of it. Um, but I think for me, that's exactly why, personally, that's exactly why I love development because um, it's about people. Um, and I think as, our, as an industry, we tend to forget that. Um, we do focus a, 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 most of our attention on the buildings and the, um, and the structures and we forget that people are the most important asset and actually folk understanding what people want, understanding what, what people need and responding to that for us is the most important thing that we should be doing as, as developers. Um, and uh, so, so as first base, as you know, we're, we are a developer, we operate in this world, um, but we struggle with that term, if I'm totally honest, because we, you know, we see ourselves, you know, we focus much more on kind of the people end of development and um, focusing much more on social value and, and the long-term benefit that development has on places rather than, you know, plonking a place down and going, ta-da, we've succeeded. Um, so, so for us, success is about how does a place create, you know, how does a place enable and empower people and enable them to live a much better quality of life? And some of the stuff that Paul said about triple bottom line, it's really important to us. Um, so as a business, we've been around for well over 20 years. We spent a lot of time in London. We've de delivered multiple schemes across London. And more recently, we're doing quite a lot of work outside of London in major towns and cities. So we are currently working in Brighton, we're delivering a mixed use scheme in Brighton. Um, also in Bristol, we have a large scheme in Bristol that's going to plan in. So like you, Sue, we are very, very, um, we're sitting on tenterhooks. See, we're gonna get through that. Um, and over the past few months, albeit there's been a global pandemic, we've managed to um, secure a couple of significant opportunities, one in Cambridge, um, right next to the station in Cambridge actually, and uh, another one in Milton Keynes. Um, so for us, you're looking at, you know, major towns and cities, largely brownfield sites, largely in the city centre, um, is a key part of what, what we're delivering. And I think for us, you know, before we even embark on any opportunity in any location, we start talking to people. And I think, you know, as an industry, as I said, we forget about people, but we're also quite scared, I think. We're a little bit worried about what people are going to say. We're a bit worried about genuinely engaging. And I mean, genuinely being genuinely asking questions, not just, uh, we're just sat in the community for an hour and hope people go away. I think we've got to be brave enough to have difficult conversations because sometimes those, those conversations are difficult. They're not straightforward. I and mean, we're not going to get the answer on, on day one. Sometimes we're, we're going to get the answer on day 550, but we've got to, you know, we've got to stick at it and understand that we're building a community. It's not, this is not a development, it's a community and a place. Um, so we, we, we believe in going out really, really early. So I mentioned our Cambridge scheme. I've been, I've been stomping around Cambridge as, as um, <laughs> Francis would tell you, from, from town. I think I, I think I was there in March. And before that, I'd been there probably, you know, a couple of summers ago, talking, listening, you know, finding out what works, finding out what, what, what the opportunities are, what makes people tick, what people don't like, having those real genuine conversations. And, you know, and, and building on those relationships over a period of time. We think that's so crucial because it's, it, you know, you've got to believe in, 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 in a place and trust in a place and actually, and trust in those discussions and trust in the outcomes. So I think for me that those are the fundamental things we've got to put. If we don't put those fundamental things in place, you know, you don't create a successful place. And, and I think second is about building those partnerships. You know, we don't pretend fundamentally as much as we are, we're very people focused, we don't have all the answers and we don't pretend to. You know, we've got to build the right partnerships and the right relationships to help places succeed. And um, so we go out intentionally and have those discussions with everyone from the you know, local enterprise partnerships to the community builder organisations to um, the local community and residence groups. And we find those partnerships and we build, we build on those. Because actually that's what's going to make a place. One, it's going to help un help better understand the products, help better build support, but also create a successful place long term. We're not islands and we shouldn't operate like that. We should build it together. Um, and I think for us, one of the things that we've recognised, um, and I think Marmalade Lane speaks really well to this, that a home, you know, we, we're not just creating places that people 
you know, you call it home, but actually it's a community. And once you shut your door, you know, uh, sorry, once you open your door, you're part of that community. And how do we enable and uh, enable that through, not only through the design process, but also in a long-term management. One of, the thing, one of the things our industry does is we build places and then we kind of hand, we kind of wave wave goodbye and we come along regularly just to look at how nice it looks. And actually we've got to be, a, you know, we see our, ourselves as part of that community long-term. So how do we help you know, start to enable that, through, enable that community, community um, um, support that community to become, to, to be a community over a period of time? How do we do that as developers? You know, what tools do we put in place? I think we have a role in helping to put some tools in place and, and enabling people to take that and, and grow with it. So we think that's really, really important. And I suppose, the question that you um, that you pose Owen, around how do you build that into a large master plan i think we've been fortunate enough to have been involved in some big master plans so we were we are still involved in east village which is one of the largest um, residential schemes on the olympic park it's three thousand homes um, a school a health center and about 25 retail and, and leisure units and absolutely you know if you could do it again we, we absolutely should have thought about a a much more um, a much more flexible um, mix of use. So I think you know previously the view had always been it's actually you buy, you rent, or you part by part rent, and that's a very you know it's a tried and tested model. Is you can minimise your risk, you know what you're going to get, and you, you embark on your journey. I certainly feel, and we as a developer certainly feel that. We've got to shake that up because actually if you come from a people-centered approach that's not always the immediate route into how people see them see, see see how they want to live or live in a place we've got to look at different models and i think we're very open to that and i think we, we're very fortunate to work um with investors who take a very long-term view about um how they how they invest in places and also are very focused on esg and looking very much so at the triple bottom line so we're thinking about how do we how do we partition off large spaces so that we can you know we you know, quite frankly we can drive value in places to help support the places that we know that we we probably won't get the higher value for and they're a little bit riskier but we, we can still have that because it's responding to what people need so i think that's very much a conversation we're having we're having a similar conversation about sustainability you know how do we make sure that we're driving we are you know delivering net zero carbon locations we, we are pushing biodiversity but also we know we know it comes at a cost but we've got to have those conversations very early and build them into the, the, the design and the model and the financial models so that we are we're very well akin to that from the get-go so i think for us it's about making sure that we are you know we're doing that early we're considering those early and we're working with right investor partners and 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 building right relationships that helps to support that vision that we think is creates a successful place so i think that's my 10 minutes up That's great. And I think that's going to um, uh, attract uh, quite a few questions. And it's just a really interesting approach. I just had, uh, before we go to the questions for the audience, and again, if you're, if, if you're listening in, do get your questions in, any thoughts you've got. Um, and in the, in the chat function, if you, if you address your, your chats to the, both the panel and the audience as well, uh, where that's appropriate, that would be great. Um, I just had an initial, uh, Gemma's going to be helping with the questions as well. And I just had an initial couple of questions I was just thinking in terms of um, you know I suppose from a conventional development point of view um, and many of you've got experience and background and in, in that in that field as well how do you now you're looking at engaging communities in a lot greater greater extent how do you how does that justify it or how does that show up in your business models that it's um, something that feels viable and something that you can deliver a deliver against and make the business case for because I guess genuine community engagement throughout the development process could be seen as quite extensive and perhaps even an open-ended for for um, for some partners and I'm just wondering what advice you would give any insights you've got on how, how do you make that a, a, a viable part of a business model go on yeah, Paul, please. Uh... Yeah, can I chip in then? I mean, this is something that we grapple with constantly. Um, and it's and this is what I was going back to this um, <clears throat> idea of a, the development agreement. Um, as stories, we try not to buy land um, because we don't actually think it then aligns the developer and the investors with the community. Because when you buy land, you're kind of effectively starting a clock 
on your returns because you know a lot of our you know even our social impact investors that you know one of the metrics they use is about the, the internal rate of return and and the, the the enemy of the IRR is time and so the longer we can defer land payments which I think was something that um that Sue reflects on earlier the better but in the crafting of development agreements you have an opportunity to really set your program and set your priorities and one of the things we're finding quite difficult is that you know if you're committed to this agenda you really have to start introducing more time in your planning process to do it properly and you also have to show more cost which effectively they are you know reasonably incurred and they, they are done in the right way but in the in the in the kind of uh, the, the white heat of negotiations these things tend you know that you're always under pressure to sacrifice them i think i would be interested to you know especially from first place perspective it's there's so much skepticism of development and developers and i think we heard reference to that earlier as well you can understand why but it, it's, it's a constant battle to try and make you know create the room and capacity to do to do it and it's just something that we're just constantly you know it, cla clhl are really helpful in that respect you know helping to shine some light on on good you know that good outcomes can come of it um, but it is it's quite a challenge can't hear you, but I was, I was going to add to that and say, um, I, I agree with you, completely agree with you. I suppose the model, the approach we take is we start early before we have a, before, sometimes even before we have a project in the location, because I think for us, it, 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 it shows the genuineness, you know, we're not in, we, we're not doing this because we're racing to a planning application, we're doing this because we generally believe in this location, we want to do something here, so we want to understand it better, so that when we do have an opportunity, we're coming in quite knowledgeable and, and experienced. Um, we throw everything at it. We have a dedicated person within our team who only focuses on community engagement and, and delivering social value. So their whole focus is about that. Um, and we, um, we, we, we employ lots of different models. So we do everything from digital, face-to-face, to, -face, to app-based. So we throw as much as it so that we can get over a broad cross-section of community engagement. But, that, but for me, starting early, using multiple, multiple tools. And if you believe in it, you've got to put the resource in. That's a good, great answer. Thank you, um, Sue. I was just kind of wondering when you when you've chosen your partner with Hill, is, is do you see, see yourself as the the community engagement organisation and and Hill as the professional developer? How does it, how does it work? How did you choose them? Well, we talked to a lot of um, princes before, if you know what. I mean. <laughs> um, but it, it's partly based on relationships. We'd already worked with them on the eco town in Vista. And we liked them uh, and we knew some people there and so we started talking to them about what we were doing and, and they were very keen partly because they want to build their capacity in building sustainable homes um, so I think we're yes we are the ones who are more bothered or more I mean that sounds terrible because they you know they build homes literally they're coming up with new models to build homes for homeless people they do care and have strong social values so I wouldn't see it quite as black and white as that but obviously we will we've brought this model and they've bought into our model so that's how we're going to do it <laughs> so I I, there, there, I think the tensions are that um, so we have had some discussions with some community-led housing groups and I think the tensions are there are a lot of very good professional people in community-led housing groups and he'll need to manage the risk as Paul spoke about and we're very aware of that because you know we've got risk in there as well on every level and sometimes it's a it takes quite a lot of time to discuss well they need to be able to pay the bank back we do need to have some market homes um you know the whole financial discussion because people are very suspicious of anyone who's called a developer and I I actually agonized over becoming a developer again because I, I don't want people to say, oh, she's a developer because it's got a bad reputation. Um, so I like to say that we're nice developers, as I'm sure First Base are, <laughs> and obviously <laughs> town, and stories. Um, <laughs> that really answers your question. <laughs> No, I think that's, I think, yeah, I think that is quite, it is interesting to really kind of delve into that kind of relationship between developers and community and to try and understand, I guess, the risk from both sides, really, particularly, I think somebody's talking about the Grosmer report earlier in the, earlier in the week and, and, and low levels of, um, of, of trust with developers. 
but um, yeah, I think it's trying to trying to understand how to understand that risk from both the community's perspective and also the developer's perspective. And um, yeah, I mean, I was quite quite interested with um, Francis. I was wondering if it's possible to bring you in really to talk about the you know from a community's perspective how you 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 might see that kind of managing that risk or that relationship with a community. In, when in your community days, uh, I suppose in the development process, working with town, how that how that felt? How did you assess that kind of relationship? How did you manage the risk, the the relationship to, from the community's perspective to town, so that it, that it worked for both sides? Oh, just need to unmute you. A lot of dialogue is, is really the key to it um, and both with the developer and within our group and and also accepting that everybody's has a different um, perspective on that relationship and and that that stayed through the process really and I remember at one point we we needed to do a sort of risk analysis really get everybody's fears and worries on the table and really analyze how real they were and where they rested and and try and help people through that process but I, I obviously it just it does come back to good quality dialogue and uh, and transparency and openness that to make that mm. work and you had a very structured process i think town have a very structured process of engagement with with in terms of co-designing a site i think with with communities well, I think the advantage on the Marmalade Lane site is the group had done a lot of work before. They had began to form, they had discussed the site, they, that really informed the process. So actually the, from the moment towns appointed to planning, that was only five months. And that really is a result of all of that earlier work that the group had done. And the things that they had said, looked at and thought, no, actually that's not gonna be viable. Let's, let's put that, that's not our priority. And, so that was really helpful, that, that work that the group did first. I'm conscious, Owen, there's some really interesting are, questions and a lot are for Alain that I think are coming up. And there's one in the uh, chat as well. So I, I Yes, so I was just going I, to start bringing people in. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think that's the next the next job is to sort of hand over to Gemma really to, to, to open it out. But yes, I think that's... Uh... Yeah, so we've had some questions in the Q&A and I'm going to be bringing people in as panellists because we'd like to be able to see you and to have a com and join the conversation. So we're going to be bringing people in. Um, I'm first of all going to be bringing in Lee Mallet, if you bear with me one second. Um, I think Francis, you've also answered one of his questions and I think yes. it'd be great for um, everyone else to kind of hear hear your answer as well so if you just bear with me one moment Hi everybody I don't know if you can hear me Yes we can hear you, brilliant oh, Cool, okay um, On Marmalade Lane, Francis um, how easy or hard was it to arrive at the common house that everybody seems to have there? Did that produce some unique features and have there been any onward sales of properties or did you choose to limit that in any way? Um, and residents could raise mortgages, I presume, and are any of the properties leased out? Right, that multi-choice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the... Um, so working backwards, there are uh, three out of the 42 that are leased out. That is, they're people who were involved really quite a long time ago and their lives moved on, but they were desperate to buy and be part of the community. And their, their properties are let out um, at the moment and hopefully their lives will reorientate and they'll join us in the future. Um, but otherwise, uh, letting the houses are, that needs a community agreement. We really didn't want people to buy properties as an investment. Uh, the legal working group that formed of the residents were very focused on making sure that people could get mortgages on these houses from mainstream developers and that has proved to be uh, possible and that really links to your question around onward sales. The only real difference in our leases and freehold titles and we have the homes of houses of freehold, the apartments of leasehold and the 
the freehold titles are encumbered with covenants that kind of make the whole service charge arrangement work. Um, and the only difference is an eight week provision while before you can put your home on the open market where you offer it to the community and there's a sort of process around that so that the community can maintain a waiting list and a network of people who might be interested in, if a property becomes available. So that's how that works. And the common house, I actually wasn't involved at the time those conversations took place. I got involved in a, just after the client brief was developed. Um, but my understanding is there was a real process of thinking about how people might use that space. So it was focused around the uses people might use it for before thinking about the quantum of space or how it was broken down. And a lot of research into other co-housing communities and what had worked and what hadn't. As a result, we had a laundry that's used by probably two thirds of the residents here, uh, a workshop, which I thought I'd never use, but I'm beginning to really enjoy the fact I can go somewhere and find a whole load of tools that function and I can do things in there. And um, a small gym, also incredibly well used and um, three guest bedrooms and then social space, space where we can meet, a kitchen and places where we can sort of sit and eat together. So quite a generous set of spaces really, mm. along with amazingly big bin stores and we don't seem to use as many bin rubbish, we don't produce as much rubbish as perhaps the bin stores anticipated. So they're used for all sorts of other initiatives, which is great mm. fun. Sorry, I love the, um, the shared car usage as well. Ah yes, yes. Yes, I, that wasn't, I mean, obviously that sort of come about afterwards, but yes, we now have two cars increased since we visited that are shared. And we also have an electric cargo trike that's shared with the wider Orchard Park community grant funded as part of zero carbon initiative by the local authority. And it's in one of our bin, bin sheds. Um, and, and of course the shop has also come into being. So yes, absolutely. And I think the car ownership is a really interesting one because Often you see developments with a uh, sort of commercial car share going on. Um, and so this is a really quite a different initiative. We do share the cost. And so it's, it, there's both more risks. Just, it's just like owning your own car. It, it can be bumpy if this breaks down and things. Um, but that means it's actually very cost effective and you're not paying for the time that you take the car out for. I think I've done your four yeah. <laughs> bits of the question there, Lee. Um, but I don't know, a quick supplementary for a lady and Paul, really. This question of how do you, how do you allow uh, for the cost of engagement? Is it something that you've chosen to carry corporately or are you now putting a line for that cost in each of the development appraisals for the schemes? <laughs> Um, from our perspective, it's a bit of both. Um, we, we perhaps counterintuitively look at every opportunity from the base of you know, how low can we go with our margin in order to create the outcomes that we want to be associated with and we want to you know, do, do. And so in part, it's about looking at you know, the, a, a few pounds spent today may, may, may prove to reduce risk later. So it's, it, it's a bit of both, really. Um, part us, part, part, part the kind of project appraisal, but also, you know, like Brendan and his colleagues at, at CLHL, you know, there's there's interesting support. And I think Sue made reference to it as well. There is money around to help su uh, supplement that commitment that we would make um, from, from third parties. So it's a little bit of everyone, I, I would say. I was going to similar, you know, we, we, we front end a lot of our works because we go out so early, we, it's a corporate cost. We just think it's so important for us. So we, we pay for that. And then at some point we can, we can put it in, in as a line in, in the, in the project as a project cost, but we, we do front end a significant portion of it. That's great. Okay. Um, I think that, I think that addresses uh, a few of your questions there, Lee. Thank you very much for uh, contributing. Um, I have one question for me. Yeah, which I fumbled the answer digitally. <laughs> you asked about the social impact investors. There's a thing called the social impact investors group. I think you can Google them. 
uh, and we presented to them and it was very much the company by Regional Homes, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the charity because the charity hasn't got building homes in our objectives, so we had to set up a subsidiary. So they've lent that to, a, they had to lend it to a company um, and it just depends on whether it piques their interest. Uh, so two well, individually wealthy men put up quite tens of thousands of pounds each, <clears throat> which Pump primed us to help to pay to get started, basically. And you asked about, um, given that we were policy, we are policy compliant in Chobham, how did we get refused? Um, it was a bit complicated. I think if the local authority had wanted to grant planning permission, they could have done, but I think it was internal pressure, perhaps, that the, the only person in the council who said, hang on a minute, was the person providing the registered social housing who says we need that for registered social housing and uh, they objected um, there was a change while we since we'd done our appraisal which like Paul says was based we based the price of the land on making sure it was affordable when we've done all the sums and finished if you see what I mean so that's part of the initial appraisal is it going to be affordable um, and then during the time that we did the designs, the, um, the law changed in terms of how much you can pay for land. And although the, the price paid for land was set by the land next door, which was also sold for affordable housing, social housing, uh, so that's what the landowners wanted, um, it was like two thirds wiped off that. So they said, we don't agree with your sums. Uh, it's not, you know, you shouldn't pay so much for the land. So we had to go back and rework all the sums and make the case for the viability. And also there was a, a sort of technicality of an inter of a interpretation of planning law. Um, and uh, the planning officer did admit that they hadn't yet updated their local planning policies to be compliant with the national planning policies, but they were following the local policy. So, you know, that's the, um, that's planning for you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Lee. Um, Gemma, do you want to introduce the next question? I'm just going to pass straight over to Tita here. You had a number of questions in the chat, um, so I don't know if you want to ask, uh, ask yeah, away. Th thanks. I mean, uh, fantastic panel. I'd say this is a, a great event to pull such knowledge together uh, and to be promoting it. I, I suppose, um, like some of the other questions, I'm really interested in the, in the tangible things that help make this happen, which is why I think it's a great panel, because it's not just the, the fluff, if you like, it's really the nitty gritty. So my question was really about, I'd be really interested to hear about some of those tangible initiatives, both uh, Alego mentioned in terms of having a long-term, embedding oneself long-term into a community, and no doubt Paul, uh, but Paul already mentioned the 2% income, I think, from bill to rent, how that is maybe used or managed or given to the community to manage. Those sort of ideas, if anyone on the panel had other ideas about you know, how you really maintain, you don't just leave, there's some long-term investment in place, the community, those sort of things would be great to hear. Thanks. Um, well, I can chip in. Um, so in our appraisal, we put in at some seed funding for the community to get started. Uh, got chipped away a bit in the reappraisal of the appraisal, but um, some seed funding to start and then the idea that there would be the community is owning the land and the leaseholders pay a service charge. Um, there is actually, you know, you need, need to look at sources of income. Um, there's actually a phone mast on the site in the woods, <laughs> which provided a bit of income uh, for, for, the, for maintaining the grounds. Um, <clears throat> so I think we'd see it as a, a community can manage the service charge better than some big sort of company, commercial companies would do, do a better value job of it. And that's the community, when we were working on it in the kick, people were saying, well, you know, we'd like to sort of manage the gar community garden ourselves, which is what happens here at Bedstead. There actually is a contractor who's paid to come and look after it, but most of the beautification and the, all the amenities are just the community just doing it, just free of charge. Because if you give people the chance and, you know, a newly retired person or someone who's at home a bit more has got time to do things like that. So I think it's just empowering uh, the community to 
be able to get on with it, really. That's great. Did anybody else uh, want to come in at all on that? Just having a quick check. Okay. Um, so, Dita, does that kind of answer go some way to answering your question? Yeah, I, th I think it does. I suppose that's um, that's quite broad. They they are high level broad. Give some responsibility over. They are really that's really helpful. I I wonder if there are any. Um, I mean, Alida, you mentioned going in early and chatting early before you've even got a site in mind potentially. I suppose, are there any other things, kind of initiatives? So a lot of the work we do, we, we try and identify local groups or local agents who are doing great stuff already. And are there things that we can put, pull those networks together in a place? Uh, I'm an architect, but we kind of stretch that role slightly. So I'm wondering from the developer side, if there's any other initiatives or things that you think have worked or don't work that oh, are good, particularly, good. Paul mentioned outside the red line, like Paul mentioned as well. Absolutely. I think we always think it's an outside of red line because, you know, because people don't see schemes as red lines. Um, but I, I agree. So going in early, building those right relationships, we will undertake a social value um, assessment, for example. Um, we look we look at what a recommendation from a social value are and we go out and implement those, whether it's jobs, if it's you know, and it's really broad. And I think people are quite surprised when they hear us talking about, I don't know, childhood obesity, for example what's that got to do with, with you as a developer? We say, well, it's, it's something that's, that's been identified as a significant issue in this area. So we've got to, to look at how we can support initiatives that's going to help with that, because that's very much our social value is about long term. So that's a practical thing we do. Social, social value needs assessment, and we look at how we can deliver those either directly ourselves through our program, or we work with partners and put some seed funding in there to help that over a period of time. Or we start looking at how for our section 106 we can make significant contributions to, to things that have, can impact on some of those um, areas. Um, so that, those are some examples of things that we get people actively engaged in. For example, I'm thinking of a random example that in Brighton, for example, Brighton is a very creative city that has, you know, people are very interested in arts and culture. We have public art funding within our section 106. So what do we do? We've said, we don't think that should sit in the section 106. We think that should be community led. We want the community to decide on what public art means for them. You know, what does it actually mean? Is it a big old statue? Oh, actually, is it creative workspace for people to work from? Or is it grants for local artists to actually help them to, 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 to for their future? So, so we, we push we push that onto to the community. It's your responsibility. So it can be something as little, but it's quite tangible as that. Or it can be something much more grander. But I think for us, it's about always looking at how we can make sure things are community driven rather than developer or council driven, personally. Right, yeah, really interesting. I think I mentioned some approaches we'd had outside the red line in my 10 minutes. So meetings in the pub, you know, <laughs> one day we can all go back there again. Um, linking up with the person who ran the community Facebook page, um, you know, and asking, asking around, we and having dro open drop-in meetings and actually engaging people properly. I've been to so many development consultations where you see, well, as was mentioned earlier, you see some boards, it's quite misleading. So actually involving the whole community at the design stage is what we did. Um, and we got a better result, as I say, because of that. I was just wondering on the, on the, on the back of that, one of the things I was quite wondering about, which is a theme that, sort of often come, comes up, which is um, as developers, you know, what do you see as the different issues between looking for groups that are already out there? And we do have a number of community housing groups that are, that are out there that are, that are desperately looking for land. And that's, that's the main thing that holds, holds them back often from, from making progress versus an approach a bit like one of the housing associations I was talking about earlier that's actually going to secure the sites and then is going to go out there and they're confident of being able to engage their communities uh, and, and form the communities afterwards. And I was just wondering which, which, where do you stand as developers on those sort of two approaches, uh, particularly with regards to London? Because I know there'll be a lot of London groups out there who'll be keen to, to, to hear your answers on, on that. And maybe if it's possible to, I guess, um, who can we start with? I suppose, um, Alaide, we, we 
what would your what, what would your approach be? Or you're talking about they're going out there and engaging the community about de developments, but do you do you have, would you have a particular a view as or preference in terms of engaging with existing groups or Absolutely. trying to form them afterwards? Oh, I think you've got to go with what people are comfortable with first before we start creating anything. So we would go in like the Facebook groups, um, community residence groups, and also interest groups. It's not just about you know um, develop, development. I think we also think people who work or people who come and visit an area are equally as important because they have come they come with a different perspective. Um, and we, you know, so a really broad section. I think it's really important for us to get a real diversity of thought. Um, you know, we think it's very easy to, you know, focus on people who are actively engaged and who are willing to speak to us. But we also recognise that working parents might not be able to do it. So we will use we use a, a range of different channels, and that's intentional because. What we're trying to do is make sure that we get a real cross section of views and, and, and opinions and actually we want some contradictions in there. We think contradictions and, and challenges work well and we've got to be able to see through those and work through those imports. We're not looking for everyone to agree or some always, it's not always going to be a consensus. We're going to have to disagree at some point. So, um, and to do that, to get that real broad section, we have to use different models. So whether it is at some point face to face, whether it is you know, organizing specific events that we invite people to, whether it is, we use a lot of digital um, tools. So we'll go on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We, we run polls. So we do blind um, kind of vanilla polls. That it's not us. It's just, you know, if you live in an area and it geofences, he knows, it's, he knows you are, have that postcode, it'll pop up and ask you a question. What do you think about, I don't know, community facilities in, in your area? Tell us more. And using that, we then track you through. Um, we then take you through a series of questionnaires and hopefully invite you in to talk about talk to us a bit more. Um, and then one, I think once we've got comfortable with that, then we can create specific groups. Um, but I think we, we, we want to meet people at kind of almost at their point rather than trying to force them into a specific group. That's good. And, and, and Sue, from your, your experience, it's a bit of a mix both ways, actually. You, I think you almost used the phrase build it and they will come, I think, in a previous discussion. <laughs> That we had, it, you you feeling quite bold in in being able to, to to take that line? Yeah, because I've seen it work in practice. As I say, I wouldn't have named it a community led housing project, better, but actually, it was initiated by us, you know, as part of the community. And now we live here, and people have moved, come in, lived here at the beginning. Some people have moved within the development as their families grown. And, what we find is um, new people show up and they just join in really enthusiastically with what's going on. Uh, and because of the time it takes for homes to get built, the people who are involved at the beginning, as Francis said, often move away before it's finished. So I think I would say we want to engage with groups who are already out there looking for land and we want to secure sites and engage with communities after. I don't think it's an either or, I think it's the both. And the key, key issue that in London is securing sites. We looked for two years for a site. And in the end, we were sort of, it's just too hot. Or it was too hot. All, all the sites were being bid up um, and it was just too difficult. But we're, we're going again, we're trying again because we've got a new situation with a lot of people perhaps wanting to move out of London. So, you know, maybe, um, it would be great to partner with people like First Base if, you, if you've got a segment for, of affo for affordable housing to look at these new models and perhaps carve off a bit of it as a community land trust uh, that the community can can get on and maybe work with you or another developer but you know have more ownership both in the process and then when it's finished uh, so that could be an interesting experiment. So looking at looking at uh, community led element of the of, of a of a development within a larger development yeah. and seeing what can be done within that. that makes, Just yeah, another tenure you mix, you know, another yeah. mix. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be the whole the whole site. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I think that's um Gemma, do we have any other we have questions a lot of questions in. coming in all at the last minute. Um, and there are some really good ones in there as well. Um, I think we do need to kind of wrap up this session. Um, and But however, 
previous discussion we had with the panelists suggested that we could all stay on a bit longer to talk about this in more detail and some fantastic questions. So we are going to leave the Zoom link open for another 30 minutes. Um, I am going to end the session, but please do stay on if you have further questions. And my colleague Brendan is going to be um, host hosting that. Um, so yes, I just wanted to thank you all for your time. Uh, there's some, like I said, some really fantastic questions that I think we should be picking up on. Um, and just touching what, on what Owen said as well, we're working with so many community groups who are potentially looking to build a partnership with developers. So it's really interesting to see the different approaches where developers might be able to partner with those existing organizations um, or might be looking at projects they're bringing forward and thinking how community -led housing could be built into their projects in the long term. We'd also um, like people to get in touch. Feedback from the session is always really uh, useful for us. Uh, this is talk number five of six. We have one final talk this afternoon, Recircling Rent in Cooperatives, which we, where we'll be talking to housing cooperatives across London, thinking of, and looking at their expansion plans and how they might support more affordable housing as well. Um, so yes, I just wanted to thank Owen for chairing the session and to all of our panelists for joining in. Thank you for uh, your questions.